Almighty. John chapter 20. This is where Mary and the others went to the empty tomb. We finished up last week. It was around, oh, around verse 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there is where Mary, it was, it was at least her second trip to the tomb because the first time she was there, it was still dark. She ran and went and got Peter and John. And, and now Peter and John came. They looked in the tomb. John got there first. He just stood and looked in, probably pondering it, maybe being respectful. I'm not sure. Peter, he, he, he ran right in and saw things. And, and uh, they saw the grave clothes. They saw the head covering. It was neatly folded. It indicated that, that Jesus had, had risen from the dead since John saw us and he believed. And, but yet it says, as yet they had, had not understood the scriptures that Jesus must rise from the dead. And, and that's, I think that's an allusion there to Psalm 1610, where it prophesied that said that he will not abandon my soul to the Sheol or to the grave or to Hades. He will not abandon my soul, my soul to Sheol nor will you allow your Holy One to see decay or corruption. So it was prophesied that Jesus would not, would not remain in the grave. And of course, Jesus told the disciples that numerous times throughout his ministry, but, you know, just like us, they couldn't understand it. And until, you know, the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, we, we couldn't understand it. So anyway, so it says in verse 10, it says, so the disciples went away again to their own homes, but apparently because they didn't understand the scriptures, they didn't, and you know, they didn't understand what it meant. They knew the tomb was empty. They believed that Jesus wasn't there, but they went back to their homes. They didn't know what else to do. And that's where Mary was still there. She didn't leave. She was standing there weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped. She looked into the tomb. That's where she saw the two angels. We talked about that a little bit last time. And we looked at Exodus 25 a little bit where the the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant with the two, the two cherubim enthroned. And it says that's where God will meet with us. Let's look at Numbers chapter seven once. We didn't look at that one last time. It talks about that a little bit too. Kind of interesting. Numbers chapter seven, verse 89. Number seven, verse 89 says now when moses went into the tent of meeting to speak with him speaking to the lord he heard the voice speaking to him from above the mercy seat or the propitiation seat that was on the ark of the testimony from between the two cherubim so he spoke to him so i thought that's kind of interesting it says that you know god spoke to moses from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim and you know we talked a little bit last time about hebrews one it says how how now God speaks to us through his son. And of course, the son was in the tomb between, between the two cherubim, between the two angels on the mercy seat. He is, Jesus is the mercy seat. He is the propitiation for our sins. So, and then it says that the Lord spoke to Moses. This is on chapter eight, then speak to Aaron, etc. So anyway, the, so the Lord spoke to Moses from above the mercy seat. On the Ark of the Testimony between the two angels. And then 1 Samuel mentions that as well. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4. 1 Samuel 4. It says, The people sent to Shiloh, and from there they carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. <clears throat> They carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who sits above the cherubim, and the two sons of Eli, Hopni, and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. So the Lord of Hosts sits above the cherubim on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. So then, well, let's go to Exodus 25 again. I, I just like reading that. Exodus 25. Exodus 25, verses 17 through 22. Talking about making this mercy seat or the propitiatory seat. It says, make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide, 
make two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work, two ends of the mercy seat, propitiation seat, make one cherub at one end, one cherub at the other end, make the cherubim of one piece with the mercy seat at its two ends. And the cherubim shall have their wings spread upward, covering the mercy seat with their wings facing one another. The faces of the cherubim are to be turned toward the mercy seat. And you shall put the mercy seat on top of the ark. In the ark, you shall put the testimony, which I shall give to you. And there I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. And I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment to the sons of Israel. And God certainly did speak to us through the empty tomb, didn't he? Back to John 20. John 20, verse 11, that's where Mary was outside the tomb weeping. As she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb, and she beheld two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? So why was Mary weeping? Any idea why she was weeping? Grieving. She was grieving. Yeah, probably grieving. Yeah. Actually, it said, she says right there, she says, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Yeah. She's grieving because they, her Lord was missing. She didn't know where he was. Of course, she was thinking he was still dead at this point, but she said she didn't know where they laid him. Yeah. Isn't that weird? A little bit. I mean... It's one, if he died, he'd be, he's kind of taken away from you anyway, but she yeah. just even wants to, she just wants the knowledge to, I, I just find that overwhelming, you know, I just, hmm. I just want to know where he is. Mm. I know he's dead or, or maybe I don't, maybe I'm waiting for three days. I'll see you Sunday. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cause she, yes, yeah, she was. She was looking for the body, right? She wanted to, and I don't know. Well, and you know, and you, you hear stories of people when you know when their loved one dies, they'll yeah. practically, practically throw themselves into the casket on the body of the deceased person. So, and even like if you lose somebody in war in another country, you still want the remains right returned to the family. It's just that closure or something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, I brought that up. No, no, I no, I appreciate that because yeah, I, yeah, I kind of pondered that myself as well. And, but, and you know, maybe that's one of the reasons why we, you know, often have open caskets at, at funerals. So you know, like you said, you see, you have that closure, so you can see, okay, yeah, you know, they yeah. really, you really are, did pass, and there's the the proof. Because yeah, because you know, sometimes I don't, I don't know about you guys, but yeah, you know, when someone uh, when someone dies, I, I, I don't know. I, even I, as a as a believer, you know, I I'm, I'll be walking along and I'll, I'll see someone and like, oh, there's you know Lisa or whatever the person's name is. Like, oh no, that's not you know she's dead. I, I don't know. I guess it's just on your mind that I don't know. Or maybe I'm just weird that way. I, I'll I'll see someone and think, oh, there you know there she is or there he is, and it's like no, they're they're dead. I don't know. I mean, and she also was going to put the spices, right? So that was also something well, that she wanted to do, and it was incomplete. That's a good point. Yeah, she they were gonna she was gonna put burial spices on. So yeah, that, good point. She still just loved him enough to want to care for him. You know that yeah. that's just amazing. I love it. Yep. 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 So. Yeah, she's so wanted to care for him, wanted to complete the spices. And said, verse 14, when she said this, she turned around and she beheld Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. So why, why do you think she didn't know it was Jesus? I'm just curious if anybody has any insights on that. <laughs> I believe he kept it from her. Probably. Probably like, you know, on the road to Emmaus, it says yeah. that her eyes were prevented from recognizing him. Could be, because I, you know, well, I'm just thinking what I just shared about, you know, when someone passes, it's like every, every where I look, I, you know, it's like I'm seeing that person. So I would think if I were in her shoes and, and Jesus was standing there, 
even if it wasn't Jesus, I would, if it looked anywhere remotely like him, I'd think, oh, yeah, there you are. I don't know. And the last time she had seen him, he was the beaten, mm. you know, he was just Point. probably beaten beyond recognition. And then all of a sudden now he's just who he was, probably. I don't know. I don't know yeah. what he looked like resurrected. Well, she said he, she thought he was the gardener, so he looked like any right. normal. Didn't look like he had any issues, any problems. Or anything. Right. We know he still had the nail piercings, but you know, he probably didn't reveal them, I'm sure, at that time revealed them later so yeah he would look like any other any gardener right so yeah so she beheld jesus standing there did not know that it was jesus and yeah like you said i think he probably obscured whatever if his, if his appearance if he changed his appearance or whatever it was so he did you have some insight to share okay all right so yeah, so the angel, or I'm sorry, so Jesus said, he also said, you know, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? As if Jesus didn't know, but, you know, like, you know, he doesn't ask questions to gain information. He asks questions, you know, for us to do some thinking. So, provocative. Provo yeah, provocative, right. Provokes us to, to think. So, okay, why, woman, and, you know, woman's probably, you know, it's a, I'm sure it's a term of endearment, just like when he spoke to his mother and others. You know, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And uh, no, she, she saw, she supposed, she thought he was the gardener. Um, something I read this week, whether there's any spiritual insignificance to that or not, pointed out you know, she thought he was the gardener and point, they pointed out the, uh, I don't know if I want to say parallels, but the, uh, I guess parallels with, with Christ and Adam, um, said, you know, what was, who was the first gardener in, you know, the, the world's first gardener was Adam, right? God right. in the garden, in the garden of Eden said to tend this. Garden. Um, and of course, then you look at the other parallels, you know, well, like if you look at like Romans five, talks about Adam, second Adam in the first right, Adam, yeah. right, being the second Adam. So, um, and let, well, let, let's go to let's go to Romans five once. Romans five. Romans five, starting at verse twelve, says that. Therefore, just as through one man, that's Adam, just as through one man, sin entered into the world, sin entered into the world through Adam, and death entered into the world through, through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Okay, so spiritual death spread to all of us because we've all sinned, spread through Adam. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, even though sin wasn't imputed, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, until the law, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. Okay, so he's a type of Christ who is to come. But the free gift, and he's talking about the free gift of righteousness, the free gift of, of grace, the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, many died by his one transgression, many died, that's much more than did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. Okay, So many died because of Adam's sin. And the grace will abound to many because of Christ, those that receive it. It says, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. So it's not like the gift that came through Adam. That, that was... Actually, that wasn't really a gift, was it? That was wages. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. It's not like what came through Adam. For the one, on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression, resulting in condemnation. Okay, so that's what we got through Adam was judgment and condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. Okay, the free gift comes through Christ, results in justification. 
First, by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, death reigned through the one. So death reigned through Adam, spiritual death and physical death. Much more, those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. So you have to receive the great, the abundance of grace, receive the gift of righteousness. Those who receive it will reign in life, spiritual life, eternal life through the one Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression, as Adam in the garden, there resulted condemnation to all men. Even so through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. And that one act of righteousness is Christ on the cross through his, his death and his resurrection results in justification of life to all men. Now that all men means all that receive it. So all that receive it, as we saw in the prior verse, receive justification. Whereas through the one man's disobedience, that's Adam's disobedience, the many were made sinners. We were, we were made sinners because of his disobedience. Even so through the obedience of the one, that's the obedience of Christ, he was obedient unto death the many will be made righteous. Okay, so we're made righteous through his obedience when we trust in him and receive it. The law came in so that transgression might increase. Isn't that interesting? You know, the law came so that transgression would increase. It says, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And you think about it, you know, that's, it, that's what the law, <laughs> that's what the law did. And when we try to live under the law, it, it increases sin doesn't it it transgression increases as as paul say in in chapter seven we try to the more the harder we try to live under the law the more sin is stirred up in our in our flesh so so where sin increased grace abounded all the more so that as sin reigned in death even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through jesus christ our lord so sin reigned in death, grace reigns in righteousness. So we receive the grace, stop trying to live under the law, righteousness reigns. It's, it's imputed to us, and also as we rest in that, it, it's going to be lived out to some degree. It won't be perfectly until we see him face to face. But any thoughts on that? You're shaking your head, Tom. Yeah, I really, uh, there's a big part of me that wrestles with that because I think uh, it almost sounds like, the whole argument today where people want to defund the police, like where there is no law, you don't have to worry about, mm. you know, that kind of thing. And it'll make things better. And in my, in my mind, I can't, I can't possibly comprehend that that would make right. things better. Right. But, yeah. Well, no. Yeah. I mean, but it's like the knowledge of the law is what it's going to bring. You know, mm. I, I don't know. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, no, no, that's, that's a great point, but you know, well, Paul says, when he told Timothy, he said, the law is good if it's used lawfully. It's, it's meant for the, uh, for the lawless ones, for the ungodly, that they need the law, right? Because they're going to go out, the ungodly, they're going to go out and sin like the devil. If it wasn't for the, the law, if it wasn't for the threat of punishment, they need that to restrain them. But for a, for a child of God, we've got the Holy Spirit in us. We've got a new nature. We no longer need the law because our nature is to want to obey God. Right. So right. the lost person, your nature is to want to disobey. The saved person, your nature is you want to obey. You want to, you're now to righteousness. We were slaves to sin. Now we're slaves to righteousness. I mean, we were with sin from the time that Adam and Eve did that. But then were we still lawless until Moses? Was that where God established law that's where the law yeah the law was established right just right yeah but it says it says even without the law it said sin still reigned how did it say that um let's see how did he word that uh, where is it i just read it The law came in so that the transgression might increase. Oh, here it is. Uh, verse 13. Until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there is no law. So sin was in the world from the beginning, but it wasn't imputed evidently until. Well, what does imputed mean? Because God did flood the earth. Yeah. That's killed a, all mankind. Good, good, good question. Yeah. It, it, that, if you just looked at that verse, it would imply that 
God didn't count anyone's sins against them until the law came. But we know that's not not the case because they suffered the world suffered judgment. So yeah, I don't. I, I'm so a, how did they know what their behavior should have been? How did they know what their standard? Right. Well, it's just interesting stuff to think about. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to have to do some study and see, ask the Lord for what, for insight. In that. I don't have an answer for you right now. I don't think yeah. anybody else has any insights on that. We know in Romans 2, God said that the Gentiles, even though they don't have the law, have the law written on their hearts. So, right. So right. it was just God put that on the hearts of people before the law was written on stones, stone tablets. Uh, yeah yeah all right well i have homework let's see. make a note so i don't forget my homework um. <laughs> it's, it's good to be provoked man to it is understand why we believe and I, what we I love believe. that it's, yeah i love that about you You're holding me accountable all right Oh, me too. I mean, that's the only reason I'm asking because I yeah. don't know. Yeah, no, I love that. All right. And then let's see, First Corinthians 15 talks about the contrast between Adam and, and Christ. First Corinthians 15, let's see if that gives us any insight. First Corinthians 15, verse 21 said, for since by a man came death, that's Adam, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so now I'm talking about death and resurrection. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming. Okay, so the ones that are going to be made alive are those that are Christ. And of course, those that are Christ are the ones that have believed in him. Then comes the end, when he delivers up the kingdom to, to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. All right, so sin came through Adam, death came through Adam, justification comes through Christ, life comes through Christ. All right, 45, and jump down to verse 45. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, that's Christ, became a life-giving spirit. Okay, so Adam was a living soul, but Christ is a life-giving spirit. He gives life to all who believe on him, all who receive him. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, that's Adam earthy the second man is from heaven that's christ as is the earthy so also are those who are earthy that's every lost person and as is the heavenly so also are those who are heavenly that's all those who are believers in christ and just as we have been born the image of the earthy we shall also bear the image of the heavenly okay so we're born in the image of adam those who believe are born again shall bear the image of the heavenly, bear the image of Christ. Romans 8 talks about that a little bit too, conform to the image of his son. That won't be fully accomplished till we're out of these bodies of flesh, but in our spirit, we're, we bear his image, bear the fruit of the spirit. That's his character. All right. Uh, it was Genesis two? Uh, Genesis two seven was when he was given dominion to in the garden. All right, sin and death came through Adam. Righteousness and life came through Christ. And we talked about this once before, but out of uh, Adam's side, of course, came his bride, came Eve, and, and you could make the argument out of out of Christ's side when his body, his side was pierced with this. With the spear came his his bride, the body of Christ. You could say that the bride of Christ. Mm. Yeah, Sandra, you have something to share? Yeah, when you were talking about the gardener being Adam being the first gardener and Christ too, I was reminded of uh, 
the parable of the gar gardener that um, Jesus shared, I think in uh, Luke, Luke 13 it is. And he talks about how the owner of the vineyard um, comes and says, I'm going to cut down the tree. And then um, the gardener actually says, no, just give me some more time. You know, please, I'll, I'll work with it. And, um, and that the gardener in that parable is, is him himself, Jesus, mm -hmm. you know, and that's how he is uh, interceding for us. Good point. Thank you, Sander. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, don't cut it down. Let me tend to it. Let me fertilize it so it can bear fruit. Thank you, Sandra. All right, back to John 20. So Mary, you suppose Jesus to be the gardener? She said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where have you laid him and I will take him away. Okay, so she's going to take him away, apply the spices, care for his body. Interesting that, uh, well, back to verse 13, a point there, when she encountered the angels, interesting that she wasn't fearful there. Because you ever notice how often in the, in the scripture, when an angel appears, people were terrified, and usually the first thing the angel says is what? Fear not, right? Fear not. It's interesting. She, she wasn't fearful at that time. I'm not sure why that is. Any insights on that? Mary's a real enigma to me. I mean, it, here's, she, she just loves this man with all of her heart. And yet she's been used by so many men mm. all of her life. And yet this is like what she's been looking for all along. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that in her daily work that she did at night that, you know, she ran into some very fearful situations, you know, mm. but then, this this thing the things related to Christ she <laughs> was like without fear and full of yeah. love yeah. and, and it, it's just it's just a beautiful uh, kind of a picture of, of yeah. me <laughs> yeah yeah interesting just yeah I'm just trying to digest what you shared there yeah. Um, we talk about us as wretches, you know, mm -hmm. and you always see that in people too. Some people act really tough on the outside, but then, mm -hmm. you know, if they get in a fight or something, then they, they kind of all break down and everything. I, I just see her being just all these different, I don't know, character qualities and things. Yeah. Yeah. But loving Jesus just totally unabashed. Hmm. Yeah, wiping his, washing his feet with her tears, her hair, not being ashamed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine that situation where she's in there with all these Pharisees and it, like you said, she's unabashed going in there washing his feet with her hair. And wow, and those men, all they knew her reputation, right? They, right. They were probably some of the ones that had used and abused her. Right. She was unabashed. Gosh. Yes. Hmm. All right. What did Jesus say? Whoever has been forgiven much loves much. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, so she responded to Jesus' question, saying, tell me where you've taken him, so I can take, care, take him away. And then look at verse 16 then. She said, tell me where you've taken him, so I might take him away. And then look at verse 16. She said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, in Hebrew, Rabboni, meaning teacher. What caused her to recognize him all of a sudden? His Holy Spirit, man. He revealed yeah. himself. He revealed himself. Yeah, I find it interesting that he he spoke he called her, spoke and called her by name. It, yeah, brings to mind John chapter ten. Yeah, my sheep hear my voice and they know me and they follow me. You know, she she knew his voice, recognized his voice. Although, and I think she was. I think it's interesting too that she responded to him as teacher. Or mm. I think that's what Rabbi 
right? Raboni is uh, Raboni, teacher. Like a spiritual yeah. teacher. Or, yeah. yeah. So, so why didn't, like, why doesn't God reveal himself sooner? I mean, I kind of struggle with that sometimes, you know, like, mm -hmm. why wait up until that moment, right? Mm -hmm. Not just about Mary in general, even, you know, for anybody that I kind of wonder why that is. Is it because we're not ready yet or is it? Probably. That would be my guess. You know, our, our he has to wait till our heart is soft enough. I, that would be my, that would be my thought. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? I mean, we, you know, he says he, he resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So maybe, you know, our heart has to be softened to her humble. I, although Mary, by that time, she certainly was humble. She had been softened. So I don't know. I'm just kind of thinking out loud. Anybody have any thoughts on that? Not really. I mean, yeah. not to that depth, but I think of people that you see and you want to meet and you know, and you kind of watch them and keep your eye on them a while and that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. that's, that's from your side. Why Christ doesn't choose to reveal himself? Mm -hmm. You know, because he promises, like, if you search for me, you'll find me. Right. You know, yeah. but like what you got to go through sometimes hmm. to get to that point is, is just seems like a lot, a lot more than uh, mm -hmm. we bargained for. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it God do everything in his timing instead of mm -hmm. our timing? Yeah. Yeah. He, he knows when we're ready. He knows what's best for us for whatever reason that, you know, it was best for for her to, to wait. Yeah. 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 It's, it's always referred to as a plan, you know, mm -hmm. so he's, he's got the plan. It's not just right. happens and whatever. It's yeah. a plan. Right. Yeah. He's not being capricious. He's not just, you know, just right. really whimsical. Whimsical. You know? right. right. Yeah. So I don't know if that answered your question, Sandra, but yeah. <laughs> We're all as lost as you are, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, we're all asking the same questions. But yeah, but yeah, we we can trust God that His ways are always best. And if if it's not time, it's because you know. Yeah, you're right because Scripture does say you know at different points like it wasn't His time yet to yeah. go to the cross, or if it wasn't His time yet to start his ministry right in the wedding yeah. at cana that is recorded there that it and then the time came it does say also so when the time came that was yeah, god's right. time yeah um i think personally you know like if it took like what to, i got saved in my 20s and i always feel like like oh my gosh lord why didn't you know <laughs> that 20 something mm -hmm. years you know um why did it take that long yes. you know it's Yes. It just feels like that. I wish it were sooner, way sooner. Mm -hmm. But I waste so much time. Yeah. 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 Exactly. But I, I think we just also need to be aware that He is God and yeah. He can do anything, absolutely anything, and He's the Redeemer of time too. Amen. So, Amen. Um, even yeah. the years that the locusts have, you know, eaten away, He can supernaturally bring it all back. Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I can totally relate to what you're saying. For me, it was I, I wasn't saved till I was 35. And I, you know, I went through the same thing, you know, you know, why did it take so long? You know, why? And I, you know, I know, you know, you're sovereign. You know, why, why did you wait? Why did I have to waste so much of my life? But, but then as you shared, Sandra, he, he redeems the time that I look back now, you know, however many years later, and uh, I think, you know, I'm, I can see, you know, I'm glad I went through, you know, I don't have any regrets now. I'm glad I went through the things I went through because the Lord uses that to minister to others. And, you know, he's redeemed the time, the things that I I did in the past that I thought was a waste of time, like uh, restoring cars. He's redeemed that now with the, the auto repair ministry, things like that. So yeah, God, he, he's, uh, he's an awesome God. Amen. Yeah. All right. Um, so, yeah, she refers to him as teacher. I, I, I find that kind of interesting, too. She, you know, she didn't refer.
refer to him as Lord or Savior or Master. She referred to him as teacher, which is kind of interesting. Although if you look at the Amplified Bible, it says it could be, it could also be uh, translated as master, but it's most likely translated as teacher. Um, but, but look how Jesus responded in, in verse 17. It says, stop clinging to me. You know, wouldn't, wouldn't you think, <laughs> I don't know, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. I thought maybe you're going to say something. Yeah, because she was certainly clinging to him that time when she was washing his feet with her hair. But yet here he says, he says, don't, he says, stop clinging to me. And he says, here's why. He says, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. That's kind of interesting. So what, why do you think that is? And I'm, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I'll. Is it because if he haven't ascended into heaven to the Father, he cannot send the Holy Spirit? So when he sent the Holy Spirit, it's like he could be anywhere. I, I, I think that's, I think you're on to it. Because I think he's saying, you know, I'm, you know, my work isn't done here yet, right? I still have to ascend to the Father. Yeah, she's wanting to cling to him. She's like, okay, now I finally have you. I want you to stay here forever. And I think he's essentially saying what, what you said, Heen, that you know, my work's not done yet. I've got to ascend to the Father. Remember he said in John, was it 16? He said, if I don't go back to the Father, I can't send the Comforter. He says, to your advantage, if I go to the Father and send the Comforter. And as you said, he he'll be with each one of us, living with each one of us permanently. Any thoughts on that? That is so true because it's, it's so weird that you mentioned that he because just this morning when I was, you know, with my, in at my time with God, I was reading um, Luke um, four actually. And it talks about how um, Jesus kind of wanted to get away to have some time alone. And then the crowds were searching for him hmm. and um, they looked for him everywhere. They, uh, you know, uh, he had already left to go to a secluded place. And when they finally found him, this was the people at uh, Capernaum. And so they finally found him and they held him so tightly, mm. begging him to stay with them. Mm. And he said, don't you know, there are other places I must go and offer the hope mm. of God's kingdom. Mm. And um, this is what I have been sent to do. And so um, in that moment, as I just meditated on that, you know, um, that's exactly what was revealed to me that, um, when he was on this earth, how the way they were clinging to him and he in his body could only be at one place in one time, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and um, I was so thankful that now when he went, uh, he ascended into heaven and we have the Holy Spirit. Now he, mm -hmm. we don't have to feel like that, you know, anymore. Each of us can be as close as we want to be with him um, simultaneously because he's in us now. Mm -hmm. And that's so awesome. Um yeah, it just it just makes sense even more now today. Thank you, thank you, Hayden and Sandra, for sharing that. Yeah, I, I don't know that. that it's, well, it's all just mind boggling to me. I, you know, I comprehend all. That's all I can think of. I mean, <laughs> to try to understand the mind of Christ, I, yeah. I can understand him. I if I see his son being beaten to death and crucified, even in my small little mind i can understand oh my gosh what a tragic thing mm -hmm. but for me to understand the the rest of the plan you know and what that's going to reveal itself as that mm -hmm. i'm just going to hold somebody's hand and let them walk me around that day i'm mm -hmm. just going to watch <laughs> yeah and, and and how he dwells he lives in each one of us i you know i I mean, I, I, I believe it and I experience it, yes. but to explain how that all works, I, I, it's, well, I mean, if we could fully explain God, then, you know, he wouldn't be God, right? So. Like trying to explain the universe to your three-year-old, you know? Yeah, right. What do you, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Um.
Um, but then let's go to Matthew 28, verse 9. Matthew 28, verse 9. Here, the other is a similar situation. Okay, Matthew talks about this was Mary Magdalene, the other Mary came to the grave, jumped down. Well, let's see, verse six, he's not here. He has risen, just as he said. See where he was lying. Go tell his disciples. Yeah, verse seven, go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Verse eight, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to report to his disciples. Now, now look at verse nine. Behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and they took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Notice he didn't say, Matthew didn't say anything about, you know, don't cling to me. Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee and, and there they shall see me. Um, now, I don't think that's any contradiction at all, but I just find it interesting that Matthew didn't, I think Matthew just didn't include that for whatever reason and, and John did. Because he, he doesn't say, don't cling to me, but they did, he did allow them to take hold of his feet and worship him. But then he said, don't be afraid, now go. Tell my brothers to, to go and leave for Galilee, and not, they shall see me. So, anyway. Yeah, what time? Go ahead. It's just, uh, to me, it's funny, too. I mean, here, he just tells them, don't be afraid, and he tells them to go, and they just go. And, like, yeah. probably 12 hours before that, they were hiding, you know, they were, they were hiding in the room. So that, that resurrection power that received in mm. the Holy spirit is yeah. just already, mm. you know, yeah. I don't care what they do to me now, man. Yeah. Right. My Lord is alive. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, so he says, well, just a little aside here. He's saying, what did he say there? He said, go and, Go tell my my brothers to leave for Galilee. Who do you, who are his brothers? Yeah, yeah. Let's jump to uh, where was that? Um, well, let's go back to chapter twelve, Matthew twelve forty six to forty five. Yeah, if you read that with uh, natural, doesn't he answer that? Uh, he, he specifically answers that, right? Who are my who are my brothers? Who he does. Who and keep my word. And... Amen. Yeah. Matthew 12, 46. Matthew 12, 46. Yeah, the, the natural man would, would read that and they'd say, oh, he's talking about James and Jude and, and uh, his physical brothers. But Matthew 12, 12, 46 to 40. Let's see. Uh, yeah, here we go. Matthew 12, 46, he's speaking to the multitude. Behold, his mother and his brothers were standing outside seeking to speak to him. So that there it is talking his physical mother and brothers. Someone said to him, behold, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak to you. He answered the one who was telling him that and said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of my father who is in heaven, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. So yeah, it's the disciples all in doing the will of the father. That's started in John six, where he said the will is to behold the son and believe on him. So yeah, it's all the disciples, all the believers, all that do the will of the father in heaven. So yeah, so he's saying, go tell my brothers. I saying, go tell all the disciples. All right, so back to John chapter 20, verse, okay, <clears throat> verse 18 then. So Mary came, he announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Jesus told her to, to go to my brethren, go to my brethren, say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father, my God and your God. I, I find that interesting too, saying my father and your father. My God and your God. So Mary came. She announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And he had said these things to her. I told him exactly what Jesus just said. I'm going to the Father. 
So did they, did they believe him? Well, let's go to Mark's account. Let's go to Mark 16 where Mary told the disciples. John doesn't, doesn't say what happened there. Just says that from there it was evening on that day, the first of the week, the doors were shut. Disciples were there for fear of the Jews. Okay, let's see what Mark says. Mark adds a little more detail here. Mark 16, verse 7. All right. So they entered the tomb. They saw a young man sitting in the at the right wearing a white robe. They were amazed. He said, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene. He has been crucified. He is risen. He's not here. Here's the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him just as he said to you. Okay. So saying, go tell disciples and Peter. They went out, fled from the tomb. They trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Oh, let's see. Uh, verse 9, after he had risen early in the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. She went and reported to those who had been with him. They were mourning and weeping. They heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, but they refused to believe it. Okay, so she went and she told them, but they refused to believe it. After that, he appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along. And they went away and reported to the others, but they did not believe them either. So... All right, so Mary went and told like she's supposed to, but they didn't believe it. And then we know in Luke 24, on the road to Emmaus, I think that is, Luke 24, Luke 24, 9 through 12, yeah, the road to Emmaus, it's right before the road to Emmaus. They returned from the tomb and reported all these things to the 11 and all the rest. Okay, so this is uh, Mary and the other women. They reported all these things to the 11 and all the rest. Now there were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, all through other women with them, telling these things to the apostles. And these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. I don't know why we always give Thomas a hard time, like as if he's <laughs> the only one who didn't believe. Right. Yeah. And we pick on Peter and Thomas, but <laughs> it's every one of them. They're, and it's just like you and me, you know. Yeah, we're, we're all just as bad. Yeah. So, yeah, it was nonsense. They would not believe them. Well, I figured all oh, just a bunch of silly women, right? I... <laughs> oh, it's these hysterical women. They're, they're, they're imagining things, right? Oh, I shouldn't say it. I'm getting myself in trouble. Uh, I, I don't really think that way, but that's, but that may be what they were thinking back then, because remember, a woman's testimony wasn't even permitted in the court of law. That's what it says, right? He uses the foolish to shame yeah. the wise. Yeah, yeah. Not that I think women are foolish, but back then, that's what people thought. According to the world and the society. Right. Yeah, according to the world. Yeah. Yeah. But you know better, right, Jim? I know better, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, Jesus, no better. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even how he revealed himself to the shepherds, the shepherds were the mm. lowest in society at the time, but Amen. Um, yeah, he didn't reveal himself to the like, richest kings or anything. Amen. Yeah, I, I find that so interesting. Yep. Reveal himself to the shepherds and to the to the women. And it was you know, and not even wasn't even like the high class women. You know, you'd think it'd be the you know, the queen or whatever it's the the women that were most of them anyway were, were probably thought lowly of even from other women perhaps uh, all right that's probably a good place to stop before i dig myself into a hole so <laughs> yeah i was going to suggest that about two minutes ago yeah i i a good place to stop man <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, we know that God values every person, values women just as, as much as he values men. Amen. No more male or female, slave or free, Greek or Jew. We're all one in Christ. All right. Any other thoughts? Anything we can take along with us this week? 
Mm. Yes. Now we have an awesome God. Yes. It's always good to take along with us. Right. Like a, this was like a big hug. This this whole yeah. little session was like a big hug. Just to, <laughs> to know how much like Jesus loves you and, and mm -hmm. I, I just yeah, me too. Amen. I yeah. just really feel that now. Yeah, amen. What do you all feel about like me inviting my uh, friend who uh, just baptized? Mm. He go to church, take a kid to church and all that, but uh, I don't think he's living it. Mm. Who know after the baptismal, maybe you know, um, change. Yeah, but yeah, well, yeah. Invite, her to to yeah. invite her to join us for Tuesday Bible study sometime. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Would somebody like to pray for us? Sure, I will. Thank you, Sandra. Father God, we thank you that you are so good. Thank you, Lord, that you are our firm foundation. You promised that you will never fail and you always keep your word, Lord. Um, we thank you, Father, that um, we can even call you Father and um, Jesus, we are your uh, brothers and sisters and we thank you so much that um, you have made us part of your family and we can never thank you enough, Lord. Um, thank you for that reminder today through this Bible study and um, thank you um, for the reminder that we are so loved and we are chosen by you um, and not of our own doing at all, but we are so undeserving, but we thank you, Lord, for your abundant grace and uh, mercy. Um, and uh, it's just beyond um, comprehension, Lord. And uh, we um, thank you so much for that. And we um, thank you for Jim and um, using him and uh, speaking to us. Thank you for each one um, here um, that um, just that when we share and exchange, Lord, it just um, bonds us closer um, to you. Father God and the same Holy Spirit living in each of us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that we can be connected to each other, Lord. And um, we thank you for Tom and um, Heen and Mark. And um, we pray for each one of our families and we commit uh, ourselves into your hands. And we pray for others too. We even pray for um, Heen's friend. And um, uh, we lift, lift up all those lives that were baptized, Lord. And we just pray that you will draw them closer um, to you as they walk one step at a time with you, Lord. And um, we um, pray, Father, that you will give us um, more divine opportunities that we can reflect you and share you with others. And uh, more and more hearts will turn to you, Lord. Um, those that have backslidden will return back to you. And um, those that don't know you at all um, will know you, Lord. And um, we thank you that you um, are the redeemer of time and uh, you love us so much. And uh, um, you want to give us the fullness of the life that you came, you died, you rose again to give us. And we want that, Father God. Um, we um, come at the rest of this week in your hands and our work and all that we have, our families, we, we lift it all up into your hands, Lord. Um, we ask all these things in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Sure. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good one, Thanks, guys. Everyone. Have a good one. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.